one of the most iconic armies that Games Workshop has ever produced has been the Skaven. Their look, their feel, all of it is so original and unique and exciting and fun. And it's full of grandiose heroes, hordes, evil, plots, ruin, and intrigue. The thing is, they have so much history with them that breaking down a faction is kind of difficult for newer folks. There's just so much here to talk about. Well, we're going to do that this week. We're going to take Skaven, this huge monolithic army with a long history within the setting of Games Workshop, both in Warhammer Fantasy Battles and now in Age of Sigmar, break it down in some pieces to make it a little more manageable and dedicate this whole week's video series to it. There will be more videos in the future regarding Skaven. Like I said, there's a lot here. We're going to start with this week. So today in this video, we're going to cover the fundamentals of the Skaven, who they are, where they call home, their god, the Great Horned Rat, what Warp Stone is, and the gnaw holes that give them the highest advantage when it comes to the Great War for the Mortal Realms. It's a lot to cover, so let's jump in. One of my favorite things when I got this battle tome and started reading the lore, one of the first pages opens up with this line, literally, Skaven are a race of mutant ratmen period. And I just thought, cool, nailed it, moving on. And that fundamentally is what they are. They are this kind of abhuman, these rat people, and they have a strange manner of speaking that we'll talk about later. But they stand just shorter than your typical human. These little rat men are clad in cobbled together what you can call, quote unquote, armor, which is just scraps of metal and linen they find lying around and bolt it to themselves or wrap themselves in it whenever they can do. And they also wield these cheap improvised weapons. Maybe it's a blade from some human piece of technology. Maybe it's just a shard of steel they scraped into a, a crude shape of a weapon. There's tons of art and depictions of Skaven, and, but the thing is, their appearance isn't what really defines them. At least not entirely. Besides their physical appearance, which is very notable and very different from other races in the Mortal Realms, there's really two things that articulate what a Skaven is. Their numbers, and their personality. Now the numbers one is pretty self-explanatory, right? They can reproduce at an astonishing rate. They truly do number in the trillions. In fact, it says, for, to quote the book, trillions upon trillions. In Skaven society, life is cheap and bodies are plentiful. Numerical superiority is, at the end of the day, their ultimate doomsday weapon. They can outlast any other army because they can replenish troops faster. Their attrition rate far exceeds anything else. The closest counterpart maybe being all four chaos gods being able to produce demons, but even then that's kind of a zero-sum game for them. The thing is about Skaven though, most of the Skaven race are simply slaves. They're laborers, there's workers in vast unending war machines, they're expanding their cities, making weapons, being experimented on, which we'll get to in tomorrow's video. They are miners, just workhorse rat men. But the sheer amount of them makes them a, like a real blight on the realms. It's like an infection that you can't root out. Now, numerical advantage is going to be a prominent theme this week, so I won't go too much further into it, but understand that they have a numbers game that can really just rock any other army. But I want to transfer now, more importantly, I think, to defining Skaven, right? Next to their physical attributes is their personality. What makes a Skaven is their mindset. Each one of them, from the lowliest slave worker that dies in, like, a mine, to the mightiest warlord, they all believe they are the chosen one by their deity, which we'll talk about in a second. They believe that they are smarter than those around them, that they alone should be the leader of the Skaven, and that all other races are beneath them. They all lie, cheat, steal, embellish, and blame others for their shortcomings. They plot and scheme against one another, all fighting each other to rise in power and stature amongst their kind. And because of that, they're constantly paranoid about who is seeking to put a knife in their back, while, of course, making plots and plans to put a knife in someone else's. The sheer amount of, like, anarchy and delusions of grandeur make them incredibly fun. It also makes them a very fractured race. Like, no one really trusts each other. There's a lot of power struggles and infighting by design. I'll kind of leave that little tidbit of foreshadowing there. So how does this race of like everyone trying to kill each other and, and backstab and, you know, assert dominance, how does that become a functional society? How does that become a superpower that can actually threaten 
all eight realms. Well, this seems like a really good time to transfer over and talk about Blight City. Now, this is the headquarters, the central hub of the Skaven, and it acts as a great microcosm of how Skaven work together, right? We can examine Blight City and you can get a sense of how this works kind of everywhere. An ability that we'll discuss here in just a little bit is the uh, the kind of uh, power to dig gnaw holes. And this is what it is. Skaven can burrow through the fabric of reality itself. 40K fans, if you know anything about the 40K universe, uh, the, there's a kind of a direct parallel to the webway system of the Eldar. They can start actually digging from one point to another within a realm or from realm to realm. Within the vast network that Skaven have dug from going one place to another, they burrowed out an immense opening, a big cave and chasm, and then built a city there. Blight City is the ultimate home and power base of the Skaven race. Removed from any realm, but able to access all of them. It is also the kind of home of the ruling council, where the largest clans of Skaven thrive and dominate. It's the origin point of many vast armies that pillage the realms. Skaven workers are constantly building these new crude buildings that are all kind of held aloft by uh, really rudimentary scaffolding and collapses are frequent and destructive, but because there's so many workers and there's so many hands to get the job done, new buildings immediately rise up on the rubble. And so you get this situation where you're constantly building on the collapsed ruin of what came before you. So if you go further and further down, literally down the depths of Blight City, you are kind of going back in time. It's ever changing and large beyond imagination and dangerous. So the question then becomes, how does a society function in a place like this, right? As duplicitous and fractious as Skaven are, they understand that strength lies in numbers. They often divide themselves into groups, gangs, whatever you want to call it, but their word they use is clans. We'll talk a lot more about the major clans this week, but to make it very simple, each clan reveres a different aspect of the Great Horned Rat, their deity, who we'll get to in a second. Skaven flock to each banner and excel at various things. The way the city functions is these massive continent-sized gangs working together. They share services, troops, expertise. Going back to what I said as far as each clan reveres different aspects of the Great Horned Rat, for example, Clan's Pestilence see the Great Horned Rat as this kind of infector of the realms, that they're going to fight off the enemy using biological warfare. And so the clans, pestilence, meaning all of the tiny little clans and gangs and, you know, groups of Skaven that all view the Great Horned Rat that way, are collectively known as the clans, pestilence. And so it's a bunch of smaller groups, clans, kind of cobbled together based around how they perceive their deity and how they enact his will upon the realms. When you kind of zoom out and look, kind of group those loosely together, that's when you get clans, pestilence, clan scryer, and so forth. The way the city functions is when these clans start working together. A campaign may require rats, meaning lots and lots of bodies, clan rats, from the clans of Verminus. Backed up by some ranged artillery, well a great ranged piece is the Plague Claw Catapult from the clans Pestilence. The largest of these clans each have a seat on a grand council, a council of 13. Now the cool thing about the Council of Thirteen is that there's actually only 12 seats on the Council one, the 13th being the honorary one for the Great Horned Rat, that they leave a space open for their deity to come and preside over the meeting itself. The largest of the clans all fight for control to see how many seats they can get on the Council. The more you have, the more affluence and power you have. Now there's more to cover about the Council, there's actually a lot of intrigue and stuff that. I'm going to do a dedicated video about that. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but fundamentally this is what turns a backstabbing group into a functional society. Functional is in air quotes there for sure. You find others of a mutual interest, you form a clan, and you fight for supremacy. And within each clan, meaning like the clan's pestilence for example, that same thing is happening. There's sub-clans in there all fighting for dominance. The highest thing you can become is the council member of the clan's, say, Scryer, or the clan's Pestilence, or clan Eshin. In this way, you divide all the Skaven up by their skill set, and they have a somewhat functional government that allows them to work together to give them a place to kind of pool their resources and come up with plans. And realistically, it does help that their logic kind of, uh, it kind of goes 
I'm first, Skaven is second, everyone else is nothing. And by that I mean every Skaven intrinsically thinks that they deserve to be the most powerful and affluent of all the Skaven. Next to that is the idea that we as all Skaven are all superior to literally everything else. And so if there's any kind of threat, if there's an enemy holding something that they want and they want to take it from them, they will all unify around that. So it's not like their infighting is like to a fault where they can't function together. No, they definitely can. It's just when the politicking happens after the battle or between battles, that's when things get really brutal. So zooming back out again, we're going to take another look at Blight City. The amount of resources this place requires are staggering. They need lots of captives, raw materials for creations, all the th works that we're going to talk about the rest of the week. And these alliances that these clans can make are just convenient to get those things accomplished. Another thing to bring up about Blight City is it sits on a large, large deposit of Warpstone, which we'll talk about towards the end of the video. Which kind of leads me right into the kind of uh, end section here, which is the other stuff. The other stuff that I want to cover to give people a very base understanding of what a Skaven is. Uh, there's the Great Horned Rat, Warpstone, and knot holes. I talked about warpstone and knot holes a bit in other videos, but I want to consolidate them here because, frankly, if there's a new person looking for more information about this faction, it's nice to have it all in one place. The Great Horned Rat is the sole deity of the Skaven. He is their father, they are his children. After the destruction of the Old World, the Great Horned Rat ascended, joining the ranks of the other four Chaos Gods, but I will note they are loath to acknowledge him. To them, they've been playing quote unquote the great game, meaning which of the four Chaos Gods is going to outlive, outlast, and destroy the others. And they don't see the Great Horned Rat as being a player in that game because he's kind of a new up and comer. The issue is they do that at their own peril because the Great Horned Rat is an incredibly powerful deity. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about why I think he is truly the greatest of them all. Where the other Chaos Gods obsess endlessly over a few things, for example, uh, Nurgle being about disease, plague, but also like sorrow and the kind of loss of hope, those kinds of things. It, truthfully speaking, even though he has a few different things he points at, on the broad spectrum of all emotion and effects in the realms, it, it's actually pretty narrow. Same thing for Korn, he can be about bloodshed, rage, death metal music, but also martial prowess. You can have a warrior's code, those kinds of things. It's, it's a range of things, but it's a pretty narrow one, relatively speaking. To contrast that, the Great Horned Rat is a very complex deity with as many aspects as he has children. To the clan's Eshin, he is the shadowy assassin who is the shadows. He lurks in every corner. To the clan's Mulder, he is the ultimate flesh crafter, warping living weapons in his image. To the clan Pestilence, he ravages the realms with blight and bioweapons. And to the clan Scryer, he is the great innovator. It is the intellect of the Skaven that will see them rise with these crude looking machines and all kinds of weaponry. To the clans Verminus, he is the endless horde, the thousand heartbeats of Skaven warriors as they charge and swarm over the enemy, who focus on all different kinds of warfare. And you can see when I talked about earlier how the different clans are organized by how they perceive their deity. These are all relative to how they conduct warfare internally, for their own power struggles, but also externally, and how they can work together. So he is certainly one of the most multifaceted, the widest range of tactics, abilities, and interests of all the Chaos Gods. All Skaven exist to serve the Great Horned Rat. All Skaven fight to be a part of his plan, believing themselves to be the Chosen Ones. And as we explore the clans throughout their week, you're going to understand him more in his different aspects. But the most important takeaways are this. Uh, he is clearly one of the Chaos Gods. It is very well established that he has ascended. He is diverse in his depictions, which I truly do like. And he is everything that a Skaven is. He's just magnified. He's just more scheming and more backstabbing. He's more selfish, more grandiose. He just does those same things on a deity level scale, which is really cool. And another thing that he does, and I brought this up, I kind of alluded to it earlier, is that the way he has designed his children and, and kind of feeds their society is through infighting. The idea being that only the strongest will rise to the top. The one who is so cunning that he can outsmart his peers as well as his enemy. And so he 
designed the clans. He you know, kind of issues this infighting to weed out the weak. Even though every Skaven thinks they're the greatest and thinks they're powerful and believes that they should be in charge, there's a reason why certain Skaven are above others because they have the wit and the cunning and the power. The raw ambition to be there. Beyond that, I kind of thought there would be more lore about the Great Horned Rat within the Battle Tome. We entered this world where gods interact with mortals a lot more. I was hoping for some depictions of that, but then again, not all the gods are very interactive with their followers. Grugni is a great example. It is said though that the will of the Great Horned Rat does kind of trickle downward from the vermin lords, his literal demon legion that he has of huge hulking rat beasts, down to the leadership of the Great Council, and of course, then disseminates throughout the clan. So his will is enacted in the realms, and all his children want what he wants. Everyone's very much on the same page when it comes to Skaven of the best, the Great Horn Rat needs to be in charge of everything, and anyone who's not on board with that needs to perish. Right? They're all that's a very linear thought for the Skaven mind. It's just how they get there and the method with which they determine who's going to lead that is what makes Skaven who they are. Now the next thing I want to talk about that's very important for understanding kind of the base idea of Skaven is Warpstone. Warpstone had its origins in the old world, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip all of that. So but we see a lot of models with it. What is it? Well, Warpstone is almost like a form of Realmstone. Just as every realm embodies a powerful type of magic, so too does Blight City. At locations in every realm, you can find concentrations of magic so intense they take physical form. We call this Realmstone. And they have local, like colloquial names for it, but all in all, it's like a grand category is called Realmstone. Well, the sheer corruptive nature of Blight City and the Skaven themselves does this as well. They create their own intense evil, so intense that it takes physical form. They call theirs Warp Stone. It is pure anarchy, power, and evil solidified into what kind of looks like a black-green rock. It eats light around it and emits terrible energies. And the, like I said before, the entire Blight City is built upon a massive deposit of the stuff for a great reason. Warpstone is the pinnacle power source of the Skaven. It powers the war machines of Clan Scryer. It allows the mutation of flesh for Clan Molder. If eaten, it imbues arcane might to wizards who they call Graciers. It is a resource that is vital and plentiful to the elite. And as I said before, it's on a lot of the models, so it's not hard to, to see its importance visually. And it's referenced almost whenever they pop up in the books. They're always munching on it or something like that. So I thought it'd be important to touch on that. This is kind of the physical form of their presence solidified, and it's very important for them for powering a lot of the things that they do. It's kind of like a battery on steroids. And the last thing I want to cover is gnaw holes. And there's actually a great piece of art in the book that kind of, it's like an artist rendering of what someone thinks a gnaw hole is like, and I absolutely love it. And it's really important to understanding this faction because it gets in them in some pretty fun scenarios. Gnawholes are a unique power and feature of this faction that make them a true threat to every mortal realm. As I said before, Skaven can burrow through reality itself, creating these vast tunnel networks. If you can think of like a real rat warren in between the realms, you just can't see. Even digging out big openings and making like pocket realms and things like that. Now there's a few things to note about how gnawholes work. This is not teleportation, right? When we look at the stories where like Stormcast walk through a realm gate, they're on one side, they take maybe like three steps and all of a sudden they're on the other side and they feel this weird feeling in between. Some of the books kind of allude to that, but they don't, there's not real time walking between the two gates. It's very instantaneous. Well, this is truly literally digging from one place to another, as if you're going to dig a hole from here to another country on Earth. It takes time. You have to walk the entire distance, which is almost inconceivable, which is a huge hindrance because when you're making war bands to go out and conquer or pillage or whatever, now you have to have supplies that'll take you from point A to point B, which could be an extremely long way. And a lot of manual labor is required to get there. And in the back, you're carrying all your weapons and stuff. So when you actually get there, you're ready to fight. Another thing is that it is fairly unreliable. And this is actually one of the most important things, aspects of Nahuls, that it is unreliable. There are tunnel collapses where reality folds back in on itself and kind of seals itself up and thousands of Skaven will die as a tunnel collapses. Like most things Skaven, it's just as likely to kill the user as it is the enemy. Tunnel collapses are common 
And beyond that, the science for, I say science in huge air quotes, whenever that word is used for Skaven, just imagine air quotes. Whenever science uh, they have for determining where they're starting to where they're ending, kind of like mapping out the route, is very unreliable. So oftentimes they'll make the trek all the way to their destination, but come out in the wrong place, sometimes to disastrous results. It's a big gamble. There's actually a malign importance short story that actually really covers this, and I'll try to leave it in the link down below, but it's called The Great Gnaw. And the story basically goes that there is this war band that's digging from one place to Shy-ish, try and get in there and get some of that sweet, sweet grave sand, uh, realm stone, just to power some other stuff up. And they are digging their way, they're almost at the end, and when they actually reach the end, I'm gonna spoil the story here, it's just like a couple paragraphs long, uh, water starts to pour from the end of the tunnel that they have spent months digging through. Well, what happened was somehow they got off course and instead of arriving like at the feet of Nagash to steal, pillage, and kill him, they accidentally burrowed into the bottom of an ocean. And what it did was it literally drains the ocean. And this has huge implications because there's Edith Deepkin who were hiding in that ocean who are now all of a sudden very, very visible to the death armies around them. The point being, this kind of thing is a powerful ability, but when it goes wrong, it goes severely wrong. So as I said, it's a huge gamble, but the cool thing is, is it gives them a reason to be anywhere. They really can pop up anywhere and it will make narrative sense. They just don't know where they're going. Their technology is so imprecise that they could arrive at their destination pretty close to it and still require a lot of travel to get there or just completely at the bottom of an ocean. But I will say the ability to not need realm gates does give them a superior advantage when it comes to like being able to move your troops around the realms. They do have sort of these routes they've established that are pretty secure over time, right? They managed to get from one place to, to another and then just kind of kept building up that same tunnel until it was very secure. And so they can move armies pretty much wherever they want to go. So backing up and we're going to talk about why is this faction cool, right? What are all these things when they come together? How does this breathe life into such a faction? Well, this is one of the most characterful armies there is. The way they speak, they act, they multiply, it just adds to it. The Great Horn Rat loving the way his society operates because it weeds out the weak. Like only the most scaveny of the Skaven are ever going to be on top. And that dovetails well into something I always talk about when I talk about horde armies. That in a horde army, say you have like 200 miles on the table, your characters matter more because you can have tons of kind of faceless nobodies, but all of a sudden your, your characters are the ones defining the temperament and personality of that army. This narrative construction, right, it doubles down on that idea that your characters in any Skaven army, in any Skaven clan, would be the most Skaveny of the Skaven in that clan. The most characterful ones will be your heroes. The two ideas just work so well together. Another thing I found very interesting was the Skaven's depiction of other races, right? They call them things, like they, I guess we would say dehumanize them, right? But they're Skaven, they're not human. So they kind of turn them into objects. These are man things, elf things, green things, etc. And I find it really, really interesting that like we treat them as obstacle objects. They're not even real. They don't acknowledge that, that humans also have free will and plots and plans and intrigue and all this stuff like that, which they do, of course, but they're so laser light focused on their own superiority that everything else is just taken down to being an object, an object that's in the way. And for Skaven, this is fundamental to their worldview. There are only the Skaven, everything else is an obstacle. None of these other factions and their drama and epic tales matter. Only the Great Horned Rat matters. Only the superiority of the Skaven and that I, whatever Skaven you are, and the chosen one to bring us there. My point in saying this is that even baked into their language, you can understand what this faction is all about, how they view others, how they instantly know what they want. And I just, I love it. Between the background, the character, the speech, and the kind of the structure of the factions, it is certainly one of the most interesting races in the game. In addition to that, the Great Horned Rat is a very interesting deity. And as I said before, uh, I'm gonna ex I wish they had kind of expanded on him just a little bit more, but there's still quite a bit to talk about. The biggest thing being is just how many different views there are about him. We have a very solid view of Sigmar, Nagash, and Alariel, even the Chaos Gods, and they're all like solely interested in just a handful of things. Collectively, all of them are. 
But the Great Horn Rat is an inventor, an assassin, a grand wizard, a warlord, a plague bringer, a flush crafter. Each clan worships different aspects of him because he is all of those things, taken to the highest degree. The next kind of closest thing I can imagine is like Gorka Morka, right? Where there's tons of different mythologies built around him and stuff like that. But these are far more concrete than like origin stories that are lost to time. This is how I interpret uh, my idea of my deity and how I bring about that aspect on the realms. It changes the way they live, they band together with others, the way they fight and survive. Because of that, I'd love to hear a story where the Great Horned Rat speaks. In the last year or two, we've seen uh, a lot of interactions with gods and mortals and that kind of stuff. And I would love that from the Great Horned Rat. It might be just a small bit of dialogue here and there, but I think it would really add to him. The closest that we tend to get are the kind of machinations of the vermin lords, who act as his, like, greater demons. So friends, those are my thoughts right now on the kind of introduction to the Skaven race. There's gonna be a lot of things coming at you this week. These videos are probably gonna be pretty long because frankly, there's so much to talk about with this faction. What we're gonna jump into is some of the various clans across the week. Not all of them have as many models, so I might double up some videos. Uh, I think Master Clan and Eshin are gonna be one video. But I wanna talk about some characters, some notable things from their history, and just really dive into this faction because it, it is so much fun. There were two factions I said, uh, I've said multiple times over the last three years that I've had this channel. The two factions that GW needs to do is they need to do free people, so we have a uh, perspective that we understand, and they need to do Skaven because it's their most iconic intellectual property. And it's here, and I am loving this book so much that I actually picked up the army myself. So thank you all so much for watching. Tune in tomorrow for your next Skaven lore video as we touch on Clan Scryer. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy wargaming.